Thank you for joining Maya's first, very, very first webinar with the title Advancing Climate Resilience in European Cities, Innovation and Strategies for Urban Adaptation. Um, my name is Athena Likos. I'm working at the Austrian Institute of Technology, and I will be moderating this session. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to briefly give you an overview of what Project Maya is about and why we're hosting these webinars. Maya stands for maximizing the impact and synergy of European climate change research and innovation. We received funding from the European Commission under the Type of Action Coordination and Support Action with a budget of 4 million euros. The project started in September 2022 and it's going to go till August 2025. The consortium has 12 partners across Europe. And AIT's role in this project is to reach a wider audience in the scientific community and other relevant stakeholders. What Maya wants to do is bring together best practices with problem regions so they can help them with what has already been done. So who, are, who is our audience? It's policy and decision makers, um, innovation ecosystems with relevant stakeholders such as enterprises, practitioners, urban and special planners, technicians, project managers, innovators, experts in climate planning, founders and investors. We also want to address the scientific community because we really want to bring to the light what their work, something that really works well and we can help regions that are, are fighting climate change. Lastly, we want to address the civil society, including youth, high impact professionals, <coughs> forward thinking strategies and the general audience. So Maya brings together previous experiences of a carefully curated set of past and ongoing Horizon 2020 projects concerning innovation and climate resilience, such as the EU projects Clarity, Driver, Placard, Rescue, and many more. So without delaying any further, I would like to introduce Dr. Christina Liang. She's a climate researcher at the Department of Monitoring and Exploration Technologies at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Germany. She's a founder of a microplastic citizen science program for which she was recognized as a finalist in the New Zealand Woman of Influence Awards. She continues to emphasize the impact and societal importance of citizen science and applies her expertise to City Clean Project by incorporating data generating but citizen science approaches for urban climate monitoring. Dr. Liang, the floor is yours. Um, so um, as uh, Athena introduced me, I'm Christine from the Helmholtz Center of Environmental Research in Germany, and I will be talking about Project CityClim, Next Generation City Climate Services Using Advanced Weather Models and Emerging Data Sources. And today I am representing the whole CityClim team, um, who is 12 consortium partners across six countries in Europe. And we are comprised of industry, research institutes, uh, city administration, and even a media group. Um, and also the project is driven by the four pilot cities um, addressing diverse cultural and climatic regions in Europe. And uh, those are uh, Luxembourg, um, Thessaloniki in Greece, Valencia in Spain, and Karlsruhe in Germany. So just a little bit of background um, before I talk about the project. Um, and of course, this is a, a climate resilience webinar, so I'm sure you're all aware uh, already that um, climate change has a significant influence uh, upon um, human life in cities, such as the habitability and quality of life. And with heat stress likely to intensify with climate change, this poses significant risks to these urban centers and its citizens. Uh, for example, urban heat islands have a range of negative effects, including increased energy consumption, as well as um, air pollution due to the, the thermal uh, temperature inversion trapping uh, smoke, uh, trapping smog and, and pollution, um, and a range of other heat-related health problems. So um, that's the, the doom and the gloom side of things. But uh, the positive is that cities are catalysts for change and have the resources and the power to deal with complex climate challenges. So cities can and will play a vital role in climate adaptation, adaptation solutions. Um, so that's all very inspiring, um, but 
exactly how will city CityClim help cities to achieve this climate action? Um, so the project aim is to use emerging data sources such as satellite and airborne data, um, as well as in situ measurements like citizen science data and um, combine it to develop an open platform and an advanced urban weather forecasting tool. Uh, so a very high resolution um, weather model uh, to provide these climate services across diverse cities in Europe. So the output of this uh, broadly in two categories will be citizen climate knowledge services. So that will be uh, near real time warnings for um, heat waves, air pollution, um, and as well as another category for city administration services. Uh, so uh, in addition, there will be a simulation scenario tool. So um, users can modify urban areas and explore the impacts of their modification to urban climate uh, with respect to heat, pollution, and airflow. Uh, for example, um, they could look at what if there was a green space, a park, instead of um, concrete, instead of a parking lot, and how that would affect the land surface temperature. So the Ultra HD weather model underpins a lot of the climate services in City Klim. What is, exactly is it? Um, it it's a weather uh, model just like any other that runs forecasts. Um, however, the difference is the high resolution. So the resolution that's suitable for a high heterogeneity um, area like urban environments. And its operational loop is every six hours, it would produce forecasts for the next two to three days. Um, as well, uh, Earth observation can be used to, to sharpen land surface mm -hmm. temperature data even further. So um, by taking advantage of the high resolution optical sensors in satellites uh, like Landsat or Sentinel-2, um, with the downscaled images, we can analyze heat island effects in urban areas and estimate relevant thermal indices. Uh, another unique point of the CityClim project is our citizen science methods. Um, so uh, it's it's exciting because um, a couple of weeks ago we were in Karlsruhe and uh, next week we'll be in Valencia and the week after in, in Thessaloniki um, in order to start our campaign of collection of in situ um, citizen science climate data. Um, using meteo trackers, which citizens can put on their bicycles and produce a heat map similar to the one um, that you see in the top right corner uh, of the slide. Um, and it, within the project, there's a spectrum of citizen engagement. So beyond the data collection, there will be a crowdsourcing of, his, of historical data and similar to the platform that you see that Meteologics already has for historical data on the bottom left, um, as well as a citizen heat sensation map so that um, users can use uh, this, this map uh, that you can see a mock-up on the, the left side um, picture on the RTL website and also available on the RTL app on phones to, for example, plan a safe and comfortable route through conditions where there's high heat. And the city administrations are also going to be organizing climate adaptation co-design workshops. So that brings together citizens and decision makers together um, to work out climate adaptation solutions. So it's a whole spectrum of citizen engagement and that's something that we're really excited and proud of in the City Clean project. So this is a rough timeline of the innovation stages that the project covers um, from the start uh, to the early prototypes to the full prototypes and then the start of commercialization. So um, currently we've just passed a major milestone of um, key early prototype developments of the City Glim project components. And that shows that we are on track and ready to roll out city climate services in the four pilot regions. So to give you a rundown of the achievements, um, the early prototype development was associated with 12 deliverables, including the CityClim central cloud platform and data processors. Uh, for example, the spaceborne and airborne data processors that you can see some um, preliminary images on the right there. Uh, we also 
uh, produce a functioning early prototype of advanced, the advanced urban weather model and a front end of the city administration service platform um, that the cities are now able to test. Uh, and we also uh, were able to begin the public advertisement for citizen engagement activities through a TV and radio segment and news articles um, on RTL Luxembourg. And this uh, media engagement reached over 1 million citizens. Um, so all of this, um, the achievements and the early prototypes are quite significant because this is proof of concept for city, clim city climate services. So basically it means that it works, which is um, a big deal because uh, within the project, um, the, the aim to provide this high resolution near real-time simulation um, model that's suitable for high heterogeneity urban environments is um, something that currently doesn't uh, exist in technology on an operational level. So CityClim addresses this gap as well as um, addressing the lack of implementation of scientific methods in commercial products uh, and the integration of new um, EU emissions in operational workflows and, and commercial products. Um, and overall, uh, to, to sum up, we need more projects aiming towards operational usage of scientific achievements to support the innovation transfer, um, which is why I'm really excited to hear about all of the other projects um, in this webinar. So thank you so much for your attention um, for this presentation. And uh, it's a lot to fit into 10 minutes. So um, if you want to learn more about the project, please um, visit cityclim.eu. And you can also stay up to date with what we're up to and where we are in the project by following us on our social media, LinkedIn and our Twitter. And of course, you can also contact me for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Liang. If anybody have, has any questions, uh, they're very welcome to ask them in the end of the presentation as we will have more time. And I would like now to present our second uh, speaker, which is Monse Martinez. She's our uh, uh, R&D coordinator at the Climate Change Resilience Unit at Aquatech with a PhD in environmental sciences and 15 years of experience in R&D rel related to wastewater treatment, urban drainage, climate change adaptation, and urban resilience. Uh, Mrs. Martinez, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so I'm going to present you the, the results of a LIFE project. It's called LIFE Betulo Project uh, that developed an integrated early warning system for multi-hazard and uh, risk management to ensure climate change adaptation. Uh, so uh, the project uh, started in July 2020 and finished last year. It has a duration of two, uh, two years and a half uh, and uh, Aquatech were the coordinators in collaboration with the City Council of Badalona, Metropolitan Area of Barcelona and I was the Barcelona. The project, since it's a live project, is a demonstrator project and the case study was located in Badalona. Badalona is a coastal city. Uh, near uh, Barcelona, and uh, uh, the project uh, has a budget of uh, 1.2 million euros. So the objective of the project was the development of uh, an implementation of an integrated early warning system as an adaptation measure for uh, urban areas that included the automated warnings and emergency protocols for climate risks that can affect any urban area. In the, the novelty or the innovation of the solution is that it integrated in a single platform, in a single uh, tool, all the climate risks that can affect urban areas, including fluvial flooding, combined sewer overflows. This kind of, uh, of uh, risks is very, very relevant in coastal areas like uh, Badalona. Also, it included phenomena like uh, windstorms, storm surges, heat waves, cold waves, snowfalls, forest fires, and also episodes of air pollution. 
So the functionalities of this uh, integrated early warning system are summarized here. Uh, it includes an advanced prediction of relevant weather episodes that can cause impacts in these urban areas, uh, not only in the physical part of the of the city, but also in the inhabitants. Uh, it also includes a module for a real-time monitoring of the episodes based on the data analysis of several sensors and, ca and cameras located in the in the city, and also estimates the impacts based on the advanced offline modeling tools, uh, such as uh, it estimates the streets at risk of flooding for pedestrians or vehicles, and also estimated duration of bathing water pollution quality according to the rain intensity or the heat island effect based on previous studies. Uh, it also includes a module for the identification and georeferenciation of vulnerable elements. As you know, vulnerability is one of the main factors affecting risk. So here uh, we put this emphasis in identifying and allocating elements to each of the hazards that has been considered by the platform. Also, uh, since it's a, a decision support tool and a managing support tool, it also includes a digitalization of the an automation of the emergency protocols that the risk managers or the risk owners must to accomplish in the in the in the event of of climate hazards. Finally, it also includes uh, as a as a solution com uh, in combination with the platform an APP for citizens to inform them about the warnings and all the self-protection actions that the people can perform by them, themselves to reduce the exposure and vulnerability to the climate hazards. So this is the structure of Life Betulo solution. It has several modules on it. The first one regarding data gathering in the case of Badalona, we introduce uh, the, um, the data gathering of several sources of data, including all these kind of sensors, water level, weather stations, rain gauges, air quality stations, also a buoy measuring wave height in the in the in the sea uh, to measure the the storm surge episodes. One camera measure monitoring storm surges and, and combined sewer overflows. Of course, all the weather forecasting that we. Uh, integrated from the the auto, uh, um, Catalan service of, uh, of of weather forecasting and also uh, results of bathing waters uh, quality. On the other hand, we also have this module uh, including the results. I mean, it's not an online module with module with all the models running uh, in real time, but we have incorporated the results of previous uh, modeling results that help us to show the, the, the risk managers results regarding hazard and risk maps for the different uh, climate hazards. Also, as I said, there is a module uh, digitalizing and automatizing all the emergency protocols, including alert thresholds, vulnerable elements, and detailed actions to be done. As a result, we develop two tools, as I, I as I commented before. The first one is the platform for risk managers. Um, this screen is, is well, all the, all the content is in Spanish, but I, I, I can make you like a summary. Uh, in the upper part of the of this platform, the, the user has a summary of the of the different hazards and the state that uh, they are experiencing. I mean, all the all the all the levels of pre-alert, alert, and emerging for the, each of the climate hazards are launched here. On the other hand, uh, it includes a map of the of the of the city, in this case of Badalona, showing the location of the vulnerable el elements uh, affected by one of the by each one of the of the climate hazards. Also includes the monitoring of uh, the most relevant variables affecting each hazard and a summary of the forecasting information, weather forecasting information. Uh, also includes a summary of the variables that has launched each one of the uh, of the alerts. I mean, which are the triggers that had has been uh, accomplished 
uh, to to launch each one of the of the alert levels, and of course a summary of the actions that the risk manager must perform and the responsible department inside the city council that must perform these actions. Uh, this is like a checklist um, tool for the for the risk manager that can select the actions that has been done so that the following time only the pending actions are shown. Uh, finally, uh, the platform also includes a, a summary of previous uh, episodes so that the users can learn from past experience to decide which actions to be performed. As a second uh, result or second tool uh, that uh, has resulted from Betula project, uh, as I mentioned, is the uh, Citizens app. Uh, the Citizens app, it's, it's a free app available in the Android and iOS uh, environments that can, uh, the uh, Badalona citizens can, can install in their, in their mobile phones. Uh, it includes, it's a very easy tool, I, I mean, I, a very easy, easy application. It includes a summary, first of all, of the, of the climate hazards that are in, in, in alert, in pre-alert, alert, alert or emergency, or emergency in the city of Badalona, also includes a summary of uh, of the of the causes of these of these uh, states. I mean, which are the variables or the or the values that has launched these these levels? And finally, of course, a, rec a set of recommendations of actions to do and not to do to protect themselves and. Uh, the, um, decrease the exposure and the vulnerability um, of uh, citizens and their assets to the, the climate hazards that has been launched. Uh, finally, as a, as a summary of the benefits of or, or results of the Life Betullo project, we can say that uh, the results of the project are an, innovative, uh, are an innovative integrated solution for climate risk managers. Uh, it's also a transparency and aware awareness rising tool to our citizens because of the citizens app. Uh, res um, the integrated early warning system has demonstrated uh, to be a cost efficient measure for adaptation of rural, urban areas to climate change. Inside the project, we have performed a cost benefit analysis, which has demonstrated a benefit cost ratios around uh, 14 meaning that the return of investment of this kind of technologies are very, very, very high, very, very short in time. Also, these kind of tools are aligned, totally aligned with the covenant of Myers concerning climate uh, change adaptation and mitigation and disaster risk reduction initiatives uh, and are uh, a mean to increase urban resilience and minimize impact, of course, on people's health and well-being, uh, impacts on urban assets, in the case of Badalona, also in beaches and bathers and aquatic ecosystems. So this is all about the project. So if you have any questions, you can ask me and also you can uh, check the website of the, of the project and also email me whenever you need. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monza, for your presentation. I'm sure uh, a lot of you might have questions, so please note them down and we will have a discussion at the very end. We have one more speaker. Let me just share my screen. Um, our third, oops, third speaker is Alex de la Cruz. He's an environmental engineer working as a researcher in the Urban Resilience and Climate Change Unit of Aquatech. He specialized in water management and currently developing both coordinating and technical, ta technical tasks sorry, in Project Icaria. Alex, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. As you said, I'll be presenting Project Icaria, which is named after improving climate uh, resilience of critical assets. It is a 36 month long project which started on January 2023, meaning that we are already uh, still on the very initial stages of the projects. We don't have specific results developed yet, so I will more uh, focus on explaining what we intend to do in this project and why, of course. 
project, uh, the consortium, sorry, consists of 15 different partners, and we have three main uh, case studies, uh, being the Barcelona region, the Salzburg region, and the South Asian regions. The project is coordinated by Aquatech, and funded under the program Horizon uh, Europe. Uh, this is a diverse consor consortium we're working with. We include uh, both public and private research institutions, all somehow linked to uh, research uh, in the field of climate change adaptation and urban resilience. We also have on board uh, critical asset operators as potential end users and experts on management of this kind of infrastructure and uh, representatives of the public sector, uh, such as the Metropolitan Area of Barcelona, who uh, represent the policy making side of, of this game, uh, put this way. A uh, career project was uh, conceived in a context where over the last decade, decades, a growing trend in the number of extreme weather events and natural disasters has been observed. As we all know, this is a big threat for society, the way we understand it, and especially for urban areas. We all know that due to their complexity, the many interactions and interconnections between services and citizens, cities are especially vulnerable to this situation. So in short, what we intend to do in Icaria is to develop and to promote the use of a novel comprehensive asset level modeling framework. It should enable uh, its expected end users, who would be especially risk owners, policy makers, or critical infrastructure operators, to assess their current state in terms of climate resilience, and to be able to screen which potential solutions would be more effective and more cost beneficial for their specific needs. And all that with special focus on the so-called complex and compound events. With, <clears throat> with some more detail, uh, currently the stage we are in Icaria is the first one. We are now working on developing asset level models for impact assessment of climate and multi-hazard events. So here we are developing sectorial, sectori sectorial detailed uh, numerical models to quantify the risks that different hazards natural hazards pose on specific infrastructure. Once all these tools are fully developed, they will be integrated all together in a single holistic tool that will serve to perform a risk assessment and resilience assessment of critical infrastructure from a regional point of view. This will enable a uh, policymakers uh, to understand within their regions which are the most critical or most endangered services or spots and therefore be able to plan more efficiently uh, which would be the most uh, beneficial uh, solutions uh, to improve their uh, climate resilience. We are aware that all those developments that we intend to, to generate needs to be fully aligned with the needs of society and the urban areas we're going to be working with and also, of course, with the regions. So a lot of effort is going to be de uh, devoted on the communication between the research sites and the action sites or policy making, put this way. And finally, of course, we also need to ensure that every single tool, every methodology that we develop is easily exportable and so it can be replicated in other uh, EU regions who might be interested in developing this kind of, of assessment for themselves. Going back to our case studies, we have three of them. First one is the Barcelona metropolitan area. It's a rather small region with a really high uh, population, meaning that it's a very complex and dense urban area. The second one is the Salzburg region, a much more different place, much larger region uh, that combines both densely populated urban areas with uh, countryside and alpine mountainous regions. And finally, the South Asian archipelago, which is a total of 52 inhabited islands in the south of the Asian, Asian Sea. 
which have a low, a rather low number of local inhabitants. However, they face a lot of stress due to the large number of tourism that they receive. Therefore, they experience huge fluctuations in terms of resources uh, requirements or electricity consumption, etc. Therefore, uh, <clears throat> we can see that we have three different, three very different uh, regions with very different uh, characteristics who, of course, face different risks and need different solutions. So in order to, on the first place, account for this diversity in our regions and also uh, to ensure that everything, that all the methods that we develop can be easily replicated in other regions, we've come up with the following strategy, which are the trials and the mini trials. So in order uh, to explain this better, let's take the Barcelona case study, for instance. In the trial, we're going to be focusing on two specific hazards, floods associated to extreme rain events and storm surges. We're going to develop numeric models to quantify the impact of these climate hazards on a given a range and a given number of critical assets which are of special interest for our region. Once these um, tools have been developed and implemented in the Barcelona case study, they will be replicated in the mini trial, for instance, in the South Asian region, who will be focusing on the same hazards. They will use the same methods and the same models that we have developed in Barcelona, and they will learn from our experience and from our developments. So they will have some already built in models to apply. The same way, but the other way around, South Asian uh, um, region will work on their trials on droughts, uh, workforce fires and heat waves, developing models for assessing these hazards in a combined, ma combined manner. And all the tools and developments that they've reached will be later on implemented in the Barcelona uh, mini trials as they focus again on the same three uh, hazards. And of course, the same goes for the interaction uh, with the, uh, these two case studies with the Salzburg region. So it's going to be a sort of an iterative process that is going to help us identify data gaps, uh, specific requirements, and to better see how the initially developed models for one region needs to change or need to somehow be reshaped a little bit to be uh, more easily implemented in, a, in another region. And one final aspect that I would like to remark about Project Incaria is our focus on the so-called community of practice. We want to make sure that every all our efforts are meaningful for their potential end users, as, I, as I've said before. So we've established one uh, community of practice for each one of the three case studies. And for community of practice, I mean a group of diverse stakeholders who come from different sites who have a common interest. In our case, of course, improving uh, climate resilience of critical assets, naturally, uh, meaning that they all have the same concern for one, from, for one reason, reason or another, and they have some experience, some information, some expertise that if it's bring together, they can provide a good basis of knowledge to foster and to improve the solutions that we, that we, that we reach. So these COPs will consist of on, from the consortium side, the case study facilitator and the risk owner. So two members of the of the project consortium and then third parties that we are currently engaging to engaging to this to this working group could be, for instance, a body or a department of a regional or a national government who's focused spe specifically in policies related to climate change and adaptation. Uh, operators of other critical infrastructures that we believe are essential for each given case study, representatives of social, uh, of the social, of the civil society, sorry, or even our, um, our meteorological agencies who have a lot to say in terms of which climate projections we take into account in our risk assessments. These groups are going to meet on uh, approximately every six months and in, in, in the so-called workshops that we will organize in order to have a very directional flow of information. We can hear about their needs and their expectations. They can hear about our concerns, our limitations, our data requirements, and somehow somehow work together in ensuring that all the results that we that we reach are reliable and meaningful from them. 
this would be everything from our side so far. So thank you very much for inviting Project Dicario to this workshop. And I guess that we are now open to questions in the round table. Thank you very much, Alex, for this presentation of Icaria. I would like to address first the, the three of you, the three speakers, uh, Christine, Alex and Monte. Um, since all projects are focusing on urban uh, climate resilience, adaptation and mitigation actions, do you see any potential synergies or do you see somewhere that your interests overlap or something where you could potentially collaborate? Or what are your thoughts listening to, to each other since you're really involved in the same kind of topics? Mm, well, I can start if you want. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I see clear um, synergies because um, as I explained it, uh, the, the result of Life Betulo project is, is a tool to support decision uh, makers, in this case, well, uh, risk managers. So uh, all of the results developed uh, through Christine and Alex uh, project can be integrated in a, in a decision support tool. For example, the heat island maps de developed uh, in the project of Christine can, of course, be integrated as um, affection. Um, I mean, the vulner in the intersection of vulnerability of of the risk managing tool because it gives uh, information uh, for the risk manager in which areas of the city is um, is crucial to 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 act uh, to protect citizens and, uh, and and urban assets also including um, environmental assets and uh, also uh, regarding uh, Icaria project also the um, the models uh, simulating um, interdependencies between uh, services uh, in urban areas can also like be integrated in the in in a decision uh, support tool because it gives uh, decision makers uh, information about uh, the impacts not only in the city as a whole but in the different uh, services and how uh, a reaction in or, or or a mitigation measure in one of the services can affect the the, the others. It's just to give an example. Yes, I can um, continue on that answer because I absolutely agree. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, there um, there may be you know many suitable scientific um, methods and models out there, but really it's um, combining it and and um, you know, adapting it so that it's available for operational use um, is what's really needed for that innovation. And I see that in, in all of the projects that were presented today, um, that you've produced something that is able to be used by your stakeholders, able to be used by city administration um, to, um, to work on these climate adaptation uh, solutions and, and strategies. And another thing that I, I saw with each project was the, the citizen engagement, you know, through um, through making it useful through an app or through um, that uh, community of, of practice um, involving uh, all your stakeholders, including the citizens, was something that was really nice to see in these projects. Yeah, I completely agree with both of you, and I would uh, just add that I see a special synergy with Project uh, Betulo, probably since it's a, an excellent bridge between uh, the application of these models and the communications with the citizens. By the end, what we all intend to do is to make people's life easier and less dangerous in to face extreme weather events that are going to come uh, sooner or later. So this perspective of ensuring that the outcome of a risk assessment model reaches the the, the daily life of uh, of citizens is i think is essential to make uh, all these all these big efforts especially meaningful and and useful for for society to Monte, how many citizens have already downloaded the app has any other city shown interest to replicate the same system as life Botello, the project 
Uh, yes, well, uh, we have monitored the, the number of downloads during the project so that uh, uh, the project finished in December and the citizens app was launched at, at, at the really end of the project around November. So in like in a couple of months, there were very few downloads around 300 or so. Uh, well, not too bad, but uh, we hope that during this year, uh, the number of uh, downloads will be higher because uh, now that the project is finished and uh, of course the city council has tested the, the, um, the functionalities uh, of the tool, they have launched a very intensive communication campaign because it is very important to communicate about the results and the benefits for the citizens. We hope that the number of downloads will increase, but uh, right now we haven't monitored yet the results. We are waiting like a couple of months to monitor again because uh, since the app app is, has been developed by a subcontracting uh, partner, we cannot follow directly the number of downloads by ourselves. But of course, it's a, it's a target. I mean, it's a KPI totally. Uh, regarding the, the the effectiveness of the of the project, the number of downloads. And to follow up this question, um, somebody else is asking in the chat, uh, addressing Christine and Monse. How would you describe the citizens are reacting to these projects? How are you getting their feedback? Because they can download the um, the app or the platform, but how are you receiving that uh, it's working well? How are you um, seeing if it works? or if it works to them. Okay, right now the, the APP, the, the, the APP is uh, just a unidirectional uh, tool. I mean, on, it only informs population about the, 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 the climate risk that has been launched and how they can behave to protect themselves. But in the future, meaning in future projects, our uh, interest is to include also um, a citizen's um, uh, availability to also uh, react uh, through the uh, through the through the APP, uh, putting, for example, information about events that they are seeing in the in the city, also reactions about actions that they are taking themselves but uh, right now it's is only a unidirectional tool so we cannot uh, um, receive uh, reactions from the from the citizens right now in the in the mobile app thank you uh, then i have another question addressing uh, christine for city clean uh, Somebody is asking, what does it really mean to be an open platform? And could you please elaborate on science aspect of citizen science activities within City Clean? Yes, so um, in terms of an open platform, so um, I mentioned that broadly there's two categories um, of our, our services, one being the Citizen Climate Knowledge Service. So this would be an open access platform that um, provides climate information services like actual and historical measurements um, of, of climate data. And um, the citizens will be able to access uh, analysis and visualization tools. And the idea is that we want to make it uh, accessible to um, people that don't necessarily have, you know, a meteorology uh, or science background um, with uh, easy analysis tools that, that they can um, use to uh, analyze this, this data, you know, without having to uh, download it or without having to have special, um, a special uh, like statistical software or something. Um, so really it's about accessibility and raising awareness and providing these knowledge services that, that all citizens um, or that, you know, we make it and so that most citizens are able to use it. Um, and in terms of the science aspect of uh, citizen science activities, uh, again, about, um, you know, accessibility, we want to, um, we want to involve the citizens in the whole scientific process uh, from the uh, gathering of the data to, and that's what the uh, intention of these co-design 
workshops are, uh, which will happen in the interim throughout the data collection and also at, at the end as well, is to get citizens thinking um, exactly on the scientific method and um, exactly with um, what they can do with the data. So for example, they might get together as a group after having um, gathered this meteor tracker data uh, on their bicycles uh, of the climate in their cities and then um, come up with a question that they want to answer like uh, is it actually cooler in the green spaces of the city versus where there's a lot of um, infrastructure and then they can work to solve this problem uh, using the data they collected themselves. Thank you uh, and one more question again to address you Christine from the audience is they would like to have a short overview of the science and technology beyond the short term ultra high definition resolution forecast. What's the input? How is this input translating forecast? How much uh, computational power? Yeah, so um, um, in terms of what uh, data inputs there are, um, really it's um, uh, all the emerging uh, sources, data sources that we can get our hands on. Uh, mostly it's satellite data, Copernicus data, um, the high um, resolution optical sensors on the Sentinel-2 that I spoke about, for example, um, provides high resolution in terms of um, in terms of the the visible spectrum. So that's you know the images um, that you would see of elevation and topography, for example. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Sentinel-3 has the infrared sensors, so that provides the land surface temperatures. Um, and the challenge is really to you know, combine it so that we have the higher resolution for the infrared um, sensors and infrared um, land temperature data, uh, as well as uh, cities provide themselves digital elevation models um, of uh, the infrastructure, um, uh, leaf uh, area index also from satellites data, and um, uh, other sources of heat that are known, you know, from you know, industrial areas or air conditioning. So, um, but it really, the list goes on. It's <laughs> as much information as we can to make it the highest resolution that we can. And that includes that citizen science data. Um, so we have, you know, satellites giving a broad uh, overview and um, also in situ weather, professional weather stations giving point measurements and then the citizen science data providing those mobile measurements, capturing the microclimates within the gaps. <laughs> Um, and how much computational power, a lot of computation, computational power is required uh, for something like this. So we have a lot of GPUs um, running to power this model. <laughs> I would like uh, to, uh, to conclude or kind of ask all of you, um, since Maya is trying to create synergies and bring um, EU projects together and try to amplify your efforts, how can we help you? How can Maya help you? Where do you need our help? Do you want to address more the audience, um, the the citizens, um, stakeholders, policymakers, where are you having a difficulty right now with your project, uh, given as it is right now? I can start again, if, if you don't mind. Um, sure. sure. Um, um, I switch off the camera because I, I was losing you again, so sorry. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, regarding the live betula results, our uh, audience is quite clear. Uh, we are interested in disseminating the results through local administrations because they are the the, the risk owners, the, the 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 administration in charge of taking care of citizens and urban assets. So I, uh, we think that these kind of tools can gi really give support uh, to them. So in this case, yeah, we have a clear uh, identified uh, uh, city councils mainly as the as the main um, audience for the results and of course citizens. Okay, I see a yeah. Alex. Oh, you yes. I would add that from the carrier perspective, since our scope is regional, um, 
within the consortium, as I was saying, we include uh, regional representatives also through our committee of practice, and I didn't mention it in the presentation since I didn't want to overextend myself, but we have a number of the so-called following regions, meaning that it's a uh, uh, public sector representatives, for instance, we have uh, the Valencia uh, region in Spain or Campania region in Italy, who will closely follow these uh, our developments through uh, stakeholders that are linked uh, and well connected with these regions. However, beyond that, it's a challenge. I agree. So that I would say this is one of the major uh, issues that we will face later on to make sure that other regions across Europe get to hear about our developments and get a good overview of, of what we do and they and uh, we help them understand or, or we try to convince them that our work could be useful and meaningful for them. Uh, I agree with what the other two speakers have uh, mentioned and as well. Um, you know, we want to inspire climate action, I think, so really um, the support of of disseminating and, and getting the message out there as you're already doing, you know, sharing this webinar and even just holding this webinar in the first place is really helpful for us. Um, and um, something that of course is important for all projects is the, the life span or I guess the life after the funding. So the sustainability of the project and the commercialization. Um, so uh, again, I guess support in, in um, keeping these um, projects alive <laughs> after the funding period runs out would be very useful. That's our whole aim and that's what we're doing there. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank okay. You, Geraldo, I see you, you wanted to say something previously. I just wanted to thank you all. I mean, thank you, Athena and the guys at the AIT for organizing this. This is the first webinar of, of the Maya project uh, with with the project. So, so this is really great. I think it's gone really, really nice. It was a nice, interesting discussion and a few interesting questions as well. Thanks a bunch also to Christine and Monse and Alex for um, sharing your uh, insights and, and your experiences so far. Um, I'm going to be following up as well from my side, so I'm, I'm uh, coordinating the, the work in Work Package 6, which is where this is, the webinars are embedded, uh, and we're building up a cluster of projects with different thematic groups, and so I'll be following up also on the conversation on what it is that you guys want to continue contributing, what, did, uh, what are the key research questions that are coming up and that your projects could possibly also engage in. Um, so yeah, hold on because there's there's a bit more coming on as well. But thanks a, a lot also for already participating in this one. Thank you. Thank you. If there's nothing else, I would also like to thank you from my side for making the time, preparing the presentations and giving us a really nice insight of what is happening in your projects. And I'm really uh, looking forward to supporting you to amplify your message and get a wider audience for sure. Thank you. OK. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.